I'm your host, Kurt Sandig, and welcome to Paranormal Almanac. That's right, I'm your host, Kurt Sandvig, and on this week's edition of Paranormal Almanac, we're going to be talking about one of the best UFO photos ever taken, ever seen, ever. The only problem is, only a few people have seen it, and it doesn't even exist anymore. So why are we talking about it? Well, you're going to wait and see, because we're going to find out the circumstances behind it, What happened to it all these years later? Everything in just a moment. Because that's right, first we have shout-outs. First up, we have Maggie. Welcome, Maggie. Welcome, Chuck, Angie, Anthony, Dan, Daniel, Dill, Edgar, Laura, 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 Jeff, Juliana, Kat, Matt, Todd, and Elijah. That is a whole lot of people that are way cooler than you. If you don't know why they're way cooler than you, you need to go to patreon.com slash paranormalalmanac.com For as little as a dollar a month. That's $12 a year. Anybody can do it. I can even afford that. For as little as $12 a year, you get exclusive content, exclusive episodes, and you get to hang out with some of the coolest people on the planet. Okay, let's get on to paranormal news. And in keeping with this episode's topic, let's look at a couple of UFO stories that are in the news right now. First up, a UFO was spotted over Australia. A Melbourne family claimed to have seen something unexplainable hovering over their house over the weekend and even managed to snap a picture of the mysterious object. Paul Steinberg told news.com.au that he was in the driveway of his North Caulfield home with his daughter at about 8 p.m. on Saturday night when they both spotted the UFO. He says it was flying just under the clouds. It looked like three red lights in a triangular formation, all moving silently together in a westerly direction. It was just silently moving through the sky, and we couldn't figure out what it was, and it took us a few minutes to realize it was moving quite fast. He called his wife and two other children outside, and they said they all witnessed the same object traveling what he estimated to be about 500 kilometers per hour. So this thing was definitely moving. Now, they all watched as the bright red lights zoomed silently overhead. He said it was dead silent. We wanted to discount all the regular explanations we knew of, like satellites, planes, drones, and even Venus, which had been quite bright lately. He says we're amateur plane spotters and astronomers, and we see things like satellites quite often, but this didn't tick off any of those boxes. He said even though the UFO was about one and a half kilometers above them, the lights were easily distinguishable which led him to believe that whatever it was, was very, very large. He says if it was a drone, it was definitely very high and really big. All I saw were the lights, but they were prominent. To be able to distinguish the light so clearly, it would have to have been big. He said the object covered the distance from the family's home to Albert Park, about eight and a half kilometers away, in under two minutes. It was very steady and silent for the most part, But when it got into the distance, it started to move around erratically, up and down, left and right, all over the place. During the time that we could see it, the light sometimes disappeared before reappearing in a different spot altogether. He said it danced in the sky for a full 10 minutes before it completely disappeared. And the last thing he said about it was how fast it was traveling and the fact it was so silent made it nothing like he and his family had ever seen before. So if you're in Australia and you're listening to this, keep your eyes in the sky, spot me a UFO, let's get some photos. Now another thing in paranormal news for this week's episode is another UFO spotted over Charlotte, North Carolina. Another, and when they say another, take that with a grain of salt because the first one was a blimp. But this one is supposedly a real UFO. Another alleged UFO sighting near Charlotte has appeared on Facebook And in this case, it was posted by a husband and father who says he doesn't necessarily believe in UFOs. Javion Hill, 35, of Kings Mountain, North Carolina, 
says he took several photos of the object during a storm on the night of August 18th as he drove on US 74 southwest to Charlotte. The images feature something square hovering above the tree line, and that's why I chose this one, because it's not a typical triangular or cigar-shaped or circular-shaped UFO. This is a full square UFO. But he said this square hovering UFO was above the tree line with its edges fringed in lights. Hill told the Charlotte Observer the craft frightened him to the point he didn't sleep that night. Hill says it's possible what he saw was a military craft because conspiracy theorists maintain that many UFO sightings in that region are actually experimental military spacecraft known as the TR-3B, which is an anti-gravity craft that hovers. Some believe the craft is from one of the state's military bases, which include Fort Bragg, Pope Field, and Camp Lejeune, 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 L-E-J-E-U-N-E. I don't know. There are sites that say as many people are spotting this odd TR-3B, officially, it does not exist. But as we all know, that means squat. That's the whole point of an experimental military secret aircraft. They're not supposed to officially exist. All right, with that out of the way, let's get right into the Calvin UFO incident. I've been talking for a while about wanting to do more international, well, international to me anyway, but more international paranormal or UFO stories. And this one fits the bill. It's an amazing story that I heard about years ago, but I didn't really get into it until just about a year ago when I started to research this one and realized there was something to it. The photo is a recreation. I'm going to put it up on Facebook, but just a heads up. The photo that's going up on Facebook and Instagram, I know the Instagram people that are on Facebook are getting kind of mad at me because I keep forgetting to put them up there, but I promise I'll put it up there as well. But the photo that I'm going to put up is a recreation of the original photo. The original photo, as you're about to hear, was destroyed. All right, but let's get right into it. The year was 1991. A man named Nick Pope started working in the Ministry of Defense. He was hired to run the UFO project, and he did from 91 to 94. Now, Nick Pope said he was a skeptic that wanted to believe, but he eventually became a believer in part because of the story I'm about to tell you. There was a photo that was made into a poster and it hung in the office that he'd be working at in the Ministry of Defense. He says it reminded him of that famous I Want to Believe poster in Mulder's office on the X-Files, but this photo was real. It was a poster that was made from a photo that has since become known as what I said earlier, the best known UFO photo in the UK. And I'm going to hazard a guess and say it's one of the best UFO photos of all time. So the poster showed a picture of a large diamond-shaped craft with a military jet in the background of the photo. When Pope asked about the photo, he was told that the Ministry of Defense had officially determined the image was real. They estimated the craft to have been about 25 meters, that's over 80 feet in diameter. So this thing was big. It was really big. Now that's what Pope says, but supposedly, if you ask the Ministry of Defense, and if they wanted to answer you, they will say... No definite conclusion has ever been reached regarding the large diamond-shaped object in the photo or its authenticity. Now, what's odd about that is they're responding to a photo that supposedly doesn't exist, supposedly isn't real. I'll get to the details of how this came to light in a little bit, but they're talking about something that just supposedly doesn't exist. You think they would just say, I don't know what you're talking about, or it's a fake. The fact that they say no definite conclusion has ever been reached and then to go on to describe the large diamond-shaped object in the photo is the reason I believe that this photo is legit and that this story is real. But who cares what I think? Let's get to what we know. And by we, I mean what Nick Pope and the Freedom of Information Act has told us. And that's important. That'll come up in a little bit. If you want to take everything Nick Pope says with a grain of salt... Fine. So be it. But then there's also documents that were released by the Freedom of Information Act. Once again, this is another reason that I think that this story is very legit. 
And the object is a UFO. By all accounts, it's a UFO. Okay, but let's get into the story. The diamond-shaped craft was photographed on August 4th, 1990 at 9 p.m. Two people, supposedly men, I couldn't verify two men. Depending on what story you read, it's either two people or two men. So I know it doesn't make a big difference, but I wanted to get as many facts as possible for a reason, obviously, to try and debunk it, but I couldn't. So I'm just going to say two people had been out hiking near the town of Calvine in Scotland when they spotted the large diamond-shaped object in the sky. They said it was metallic-looking. It sat in one position, hovering silently for around 10 minutes before taking off vertically at a massive speed. Vertically. Not horizontally. Whatever this thing was, and they couldn't see any engines, they couldn't see any wings, they couldn't see any cockpit. Whatever this thing was, it was diamond-shaped. It was metallic. It was huge. It was silent. And it took off vertically at a massive speed. Now, at the same time as this, the witnesses saw a Harrier jet or two doing a number of low-level passes in the same area. But they did say they weren't sure if they were chasing the UFO or even knew it was there. And that's very important because depending on what site you go to to find out information about the Calvine UFO incident, they've embellished the story. Shocker. A lot of websites out there have embellished the story that two Harrier crafts, two Harrier jets, were chasing the aircraft for a full 10 minutes at top speed. That didn't happen. According to the documents from the Freedom of Information Act and what Nick Pope said he saw in the files, the two men spotted the Harrier jets doing low-level exercises and the two men separately saw the UFO. Whether they were connected or not, they couldn't tell. Now, one of the guys took several photos and the negatives were sent to the Royal Air Force, Petrivi, and the Scottish Daily Record. I don't know what a Petrivi is, and I apologize if I'm saying that wrong. And the Scottish Daily Record, who passed them to the Ministry of Defense. Now, why the paper gave them immediately to the Ministry of Defense is kind of odd, but that is what happened. That is verifiable. The photos were then sent to the Defense Intelligence Staff, D-I-S, who then sent them on to imagery analysts at J-A-R-I-C, which is the Joint Air Reconnaissance Intelligence Center. The images were scrutinized by the Ministry of Defense, who identified the jet as a Harrier jet. They were also able to spot a second Harrier jet, but they were unable to identify the very large, diamond-shaped object clearly visible on the prints. Now, Nick Pope says, we implied and sometimes stated that we didn't investigate UFOs, but merely examined sightings to see if anything reported was any defensive interest, as if the two were somehow different. He said the Ministry of Defense was actually very interested in these cases, but often less interested in where the craft came from than what they could learn from it. They had hoped to identify some sort of technology they would be able to appropriate. Now, Nick Pope says, at one particularly surreal briefing on the UFO phenomenon, my DIS, and once again, that's Defense Intelligence Staff, he says, my Defense Intelligence Staff indicated the photo, and one of them pointed his finger to the right, it's not the Americans, he said, before pointing his finger to the left and said, and it's not the Russians. There was a pause before he concluded, and that only leaves and his voice trailed off, and he didn't complete the sentence, but his finger was pointing directly upwards. Nick Pope says that three years later, sometime in 1994, the superior of the UFO program determined that the craft was a secret American aircraft, probably some sort of drone. Now, Nick Pope says they had already asked the U.S. if the craft or something similar of theirs was being tested over the U.K., and were told, nope, There was nothing they had over the U.K. at the time. Nick believes his boss had decided to support a potential cover-up by the Americans and the Ministry of Defense and remove the poster. And he says that was the last time anyone saw this poster. Now, let let me pause right there for a second. So this poster was clearly visible by anybody that came in. So, obviously, they had to be part of the Ministry of Defense. 
but they didn't necessarily have to be have to be part of the UFO program within the Ministry of Defense. It was clearly visible. People would comment on the poster all the time, and it became just another, oh, yeah, that's a UFO, and that was it. The questions about it were so common that the people that looked at it all the time just went, oh, yeah, it's a UFO, that's a photo of a UFO. So here's my question. If the poster was so common, if so many people saw it, if it became commonplace and they thought it was a UFO, let's keep going with this reasoning of this boss. As soon as he figured out it wasn't a UFO, he removed it. That makes absolutely no sense. But let's keep with that logic. So they figure out it's a drone and they take the poster down. It was a private military office and a UFO program. Why all of a sudden was the poster taken down and seemingly destroyed? Was it taken down because he was defeated? That he, oh, it must be a drone, therefore it's not a UFO, therefore it's not part of the program? I don't believe that. I don't believe that for a second. Other people in the defense intelligence staff thought, not thought, they knew that wasn't the Americans, that wasn't the Russians, and then they pointed up to the sky. They knew it was a UFO. It seems to me that that poster should have been kept up there forever because it was possibly a UFO, because it was possibly an alien aircraft. At the very least, it's definitely a UFO. It was an unidentified flying object. It fits the description to a T. So why, it was, why was it taken down, and why, according to Nick Pope, was it seemingly destroyed? Okay, let's get back into the story. Let's jump ahead to 1996 to a man named Martin Redman who tried to get answers through a parliamentary question on the missing pictures. The Ministry of Defense said a number of negatives associated with the sighting were examined by staff responsible for air defense matters. Since it was judged they contained nothing of defense significance, the negatives were not retained and we have no record of any photographs having been taken from them. Well, we know that's a lie. There was one photograph, it became a poster, and a hell of a lot of people talked about it. So that part really doesn't surprise me too much. Of course they're going to do cover-up, especially if they're going to do cover-up on something that might possibly be of alien origin. Unfortunately, that's the last that I could find out about the original photo. Like I said, there's a recreation of the photo, and I'll get to where that came from in a minute. But let's talk about the actual photo itself for a second. According to the official documents and Nick Pope, the photo was taken at 9 p.m. If you want to pause right here and go over to the Facebook or Instagram and look at it, the first thing you're going to notice about this photo is it's daytime. It is clearly daytime. Even if the sun was setting late, the latest it would set would be 9.30 p.m. Now again, the reason I'm bringing this up is that the photo looks mid-afternoon at best. The way the mountains and the aircraft are lit up suggests a sun that's higher up in the sky. Also, I realize people go on night hikes, but 9 p.m. is a late hike in an area that might not be entirely safe in the dark. So I did a little bit more research, and checking the calendar, I found that this was a Saturday. So that makes total sense. People go hiking on Saturdays all the time. So that fits the story. Saturday, 1990. The sun on that specific day set at 9.18 p.m., so that could be true. There might have been just enough light, the way it was coming down, the way the sun was coming down, reflecting off of whatever. It could be true. The first part of the story does check out. The sun was still up at 9 p.m., it was probably a little bit earlier than 9 p.m. They probably weren't checking their clock or watches the second they saw the object. They probably did it afterwards. So you figure it was probably 8.30 p.m., maybe even earlier. Maybe it wasn't until they got back that they were trying to recreate the timeline. Could have been 8 o'clock. The point is, 9 o'clock, the sun was up on that day, and it was a Saturday, so the hiking part does make sense. Okay, now let's talk about the aircraft that can be identified. Once again, the plane in the photo is a Harrier, and it's called the AV-8B. Now, the AV-8B saw extensive action in the Gulf War of 1990 and 1991. So it fits the timeline. 
The photo was taken in 1990. The plane was in use in 1990 and could even be in that area because of the Gulf War. And the planes weren't just American. Those Harriers, those Harrier jets were also sold to the UK. So it makes total sense that these were scrambled after a UFO if that is indeed what was happening. And like I said, it's never been verified that they were even scrambled after the UFO. They might have just been doing low level they might have just been doing that low-level training thing I was talking about earlier. And again, that makes sense too if they were concerned that these planes were going to be taken into a war that was going to come up very soon or was already happening at that time. Now, the next thing in the photo. Well, that's the UFO itself. Now, this one is harder for obvious reasons, but besides the obvious, it's impossible to know how close the UFO was to the photographer in comparison to the Harrier or Harriers, depending on who you talk to. If, and it's a big if, if it was close to the same distance as the Harrier jets, this thing is huge. Regardless, the detail is great, the photos are great, the shape is great, and again, this was 1990. It's been a long time since 1990. Even the drones that we know about now or the secret military planes that we now know about that were that were being tested or used at that time, they still look nothing like this UFO. Nothing we have now that we know about and nothing that was being used back then, again, that we know about, look anything like this UFO. Okay, so let's get to the actual photo. Like I said, it was destroyed... The poster supposedly destroyed. The negatives were never kept. The photos were never kept because they had no significant, they had no significance to be kept. So how did we get the one that's on Facebook and on Instagram? Well, that one is a photocopy of a tracing of the photograph. And it was part of that Freedom of Information Act. It is impossible to figure out what the hell is in that photo If you didn't already know, if Nick Pope hadn't already seen it, the details have been lost. Shadows have been lost. In my opinion, depth has been lost. And frankly, all identifying marks on the Harrier have been lost. And that's important because if it had a belly tanker, that means it was a U.S. Harrier. That was a U.S. military Harrier. If it was a U.K. Harrier, it would have different tail markings. Unfortunately, like I said, all of those details are lost, so we'll never really know what Harrier or whose Harrier it was. And to this day, no Harrier pilot has ever come forward to say that he was in the area or saw the UFO. So until a better copy of this photo surfaces, and let's hope it does, let's hope there's still negatives out there or still a copy or still the poster out there. But until it surfaces, it's impossible to debunk this one, which leads it back to being an amazing photo of a UFO. And like I said at the beginning, and like I said at the beginning, this one intrigued me for a while, but it never really made the rounds like it should. Because again, looking at the recreation of this photo that Nick Pope has done, based on the poster that he saw, this is an astounding UFO photo with a military craft in the background. Whether it was chasing it or whether it just happened to be in the background, it gives some size, it gives some detail. It says that the military at least must have seen or known about that craft. If it appeared on radar, if it appeared on the plane's radar, if the pilot saw it, it's an incredible UFO photo with an incredible story. And again, if it was just Nick Pope, I probably wouldn't have believed it. But Nick Pope's story, and then the evidence that came out to support it from the Freedom of Information Act, leads me to believe there is way more to this story than we'll ever know, and I'm hoping that's not the case. I'm hoping we someday will know. But it also leads me to believe that this is a legit UFO incident and UFO photo. I don't have a, so what do you guys think, other than, what do you guys think of the photo? Have you taken a look at it on Facebook and Instagram? What do you guys think? Do you think it's legit? Or do you think that someone saw the photocopy of a tracing of the photo and kind of extrapolated details that probably weren't there? Since this one is a little bit of a shorter episode, not much, but a little bit of a shorter episode, let me go on to say, if you've got a ghost story, 
if you have a UFO story, if you have a paranormal story, and, and this next one is important because I'm working on it, if you have a sleep paralysis story or a shadow person story, I want to hear about it. I'm working on a number of new episodes coming up, and I need your guys' stories to help me out, especially with sleep paralysis and shadow people. I really want to delve in deep to this one, but I also want first-hand experiences of sleep paralysis and of shadow people. Thankfully, I do not have any sleep paralysis. I never have, maybe for a second or two, but I don't have it on a regular basis, which a lot of people do. So I really don't have any first-hand knowledge of this. A buddy of mine does have sleep paralysis, but he is such a skeptic that he tries to rationalize it away, which might not be a bad thing. I'm not saying it is. But I want to hear all aspects of sleep paralysis, of sleep paralysis, of astral projection, of shadow people. Because I want to go the full spectrum for that episode. So if you got a story, please, please, please send it to me on Facebook. DM me on Facebook or DM me on Instagram. If you don't feel comfortable talking on those, DM me and say, hey, what's your email address? And I'll send it out to you. I've been having a great time lately talking to a lot of different people about a variety of different paranormal things, including some ghost stories I just got that were great, some shadow people stories I got that were phenomenal. There is one listener who's fantastic. She has the best stories, and I'm hoping to share them with you guys if I get her permission. But until then, once again, I'm your host, Kurt Sandig, and this has been another edition of Paranormal Almanac. Nilbavar, Nilbizidok, 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 Nilbiz